Welcome, friends, to Voice of Assurance, the MP3 edition. I'm Dr. Tom Kakuza, pastor of Northland Bible Baptist Church in St. Cloud, Minnesota. The purpose of Voice of Assurance is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and to equip believers through verse-by-verse -verse preaching and topical message. Now, while there is no substitute for individual participation in a sound local church, I trust these messages will augment your spiritual growth and be a blessing to you. Let's go ahead now to the message. We are talking about training our children now, and last week we talked about the necessity of unconditional love. As we've seen, there are four basic practices that we must be committed to and follow through with in order to have our children turn out properly, uh, biblically. Now, if you miss any of these, you put your family in peril and your children. God wants us to practice these, and he wants us to be faithful in all of these areas. I liken it to four legs on a table. If any one of those legs is shorter or is, is not there, you're going to have great instability. And it's the same way in the home with our children. If we are lacking in these areas, and usually you will find when things start going haywire in your home, Go back, take an inventory of these four principles that we've been covering, these legs or these, these foundational truths, and say, am I failing in one of these areas? And you know what you'll usually find is that you are. You'll usually find you are failing in one of those areas. Now, what are those four areas that we have, uh, we have talked about? Well, one is unconditional love. We talked about that last week and, and what that is and how it is supposed to be carried out. The second, which we begin today, is firm, consistent discipline. Firm, consistent discipline. The third is godly biblical instruction. Godly biblical instruction. And the fourth is godly parental example. Now, we're going to be talking about, as I mentioned, discipline. Let me just mention this about last week, about unconditional love. Because people say, well, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that whatever your kids do, it's okay. It doesn't mean that. What is love? Love is seeking the highest good for another person. It's seeking the highest good for another person. It is willing to sacrifice, if need be, our very lives for another. In reality, all biblical child training is love in action. Because I am taking the truth of God, I am looking at my children and I am thinking, I want the highest good for my children. And therefore, I will do whatever it takes to give them the best I can within the boundaries of the Word of God and the principles of God's Word. And so when I respond to my children according to Scripture, and when I train our children according to Scripture, I am truly loving them. Now, it isn't always a fun atmosphere, and it's all, not always, you know, hugs and those kind of things. Sometimes it's having to take a stand. Sometimes it's tough love. Sometimes it's saying, no, you're not going to do that. Sometimes it's having to get firm. Pastor, have you ever had to get firm with your kids? Absolutely. We've had to get firm with our children and, you know, rebuke them and get tough with them. But why do we do it? Because we care. And that's what love is. But what about discipline, number two? Firm, consistent discipline. See, discipline is not what you do to a child. It's what you do for a child. Discipline is not what you do to a child. It's what you do for a child. And by the way, is that not love? Yes, according to even last week. One of the ways you show your love for your children is proper discipline. So these two are inseparably linked. Firm, consistent discipline. Discipline has to do with training them to obey and to respect authority. All right? Now listen, we're going counterculture here today, but it's, it's important. People say, well, I don't know about that. That's kind of like an old-fashioned idea. Let me ask you, friend, are we in better shape today than we were 50 years ago? No. And one of the reasons we are in worse shape is because we have forsaken the principles that God has given us in this area of the family and in this area of respect for authority. You need to teach your children respect for authority. Discipline has to do with training them to obey and to respect authority. Out of all the ingredients, these basic practices, this is the most controversial and the most rejected principle of the four that we're going to be talking about, especially any type of physical discipline. Now, when we talk about physical discipline, and discipline's more than just physical, when we talk about that, okay, we are not, I emphasize, we are not talking about child abuse. Listen, 
I am against child abuse of any kind. And uh, I, I will not put up with an adult who abuses, physically abuses a child. It is absolutely wrong. And we are against that, and we do not believe in that. You might say, well, you believe in spanking, don't you? Yes, but biblical spanking is not child abuse. It's self-controlled, it's with the head, it's with the heart, and it's done in a proper way. From the Bible's perspective, discipline includes spanking, verbal instruction, and rebuke, and encouragement for good character. Okay? But from a biblical perspective, now, this series is a biblical series on the home. And so that is what we want. We want God's mind. We do not want our mind. Listen, when it comes to training children, it's not the Donahue show, okay? Where some guy comes up with this weird idea and then they run around the crowd asking people their opinions. And, and you know, if everybody starts clapping, then all of a sudden you found truth. That's not truth. God has already spoken it. And it's found in his book. All right? This is the way it is. And that settles it. That settles it. Discipline is related to the word discipleship. It means literally a disciple is a learner or a pupil. That's what the word disciple means. And the idea is for someone to learn with the mindset to do. You might say, well, when the Bible talks about disciples in the New Testament, is that what it's talking about? Yes, that's the word. They were learners. You might say, well, I thought, I thought a disciple is a follower. No, that's the application of the learning. But a disciple, in its root, simply means a learner, a pupil. And what is it that we are trying to do? We are trying to teach our children and to train them in the ways of God. We want them to learn God's ways, not only academically and, and Bible verses, and I don't mean that in a light way. I mean that in a very serious way. But you know, knowing it is one thing. Living it's another, isn't it? Now, as we have already mentioned, what is the goal of child training? Again, the goal of child training, that they, the children, would trust Christ as their Savior and grow up to love and serve Christ. It is a training that takes a combination of correction and instruction. And this is shepherding our children. Our children are like sheep, okay? And we are shepherds to them, and we are to guide them. We are to guide them through the path of life. Uh, that's a proactive posture as a parent. It isn't, hey kids, you know what? Hey, see you later. Get out of my hair. Don't get in trouble. That's not parenting. Now listen, parenting is not nagging either, okay? You know, sometimes I think some of you parents are afraid to let your kids be kids, okay? Oh, we don't, we don't want them to ever get dirty. Why not? Let them get a little dirty. It's what you got a bathtub for. Oh, well, yeah, they, might, they might come across a germ. <laughs> yeah. So what do you do when you go into a grocery store? Do you put them in a straitjacket so they can't touch anything? You know, you're not doing them any favors, dear friend. Because we live in a germy world. Now, I'm not talking about just eating all kinds of stuff that's unhealthy or going through garbage or, you know, that we're, obviously we're not talking about that. But listen, let your kids be kids. It's important. Now, getting back to this, we need to shepherd our children. Look with me to Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29 and verse 15, it says this, the rod and reproof give wisdom. The rod and reproof give wisdom. But a child left to himself brings his mother to shame. That's proactive training of children. You have to have a hands-on, literally, sometimes, hands-on training. The rod and reproof. You notice it's a physical discipline and a verbal discipline, speaking, instructing them. We'll get more to that here in the future. But the rod, now people look at that and they'll say, well, the rod, uh, w w what, what does that word rod have to do with? The rod means the rod. Look it up in the Hebrew. It is a stick, okay? It is a piece of wood. That is the rod, and that is what God meant. He meant what he said. He didn't just say discipline them. He said part of it is with a rod. Now, hold it right there, and let me mention this, because it needs to be said. Some of you may hear that who have never been through this before, and you might say, oh no, we're not going to go there. And the reason you don't want to go there is because you as a child were physically abused. Okay? Now listen, I was not 
and I appreciate that, okay? But the very fact that you were abused shows that something wasn't done right, right? By the very nature of the word abuse, it means you've, a person's gone further than they should. Doesn't it mean that? You've abused something. You've gone further. You you twisted. You twisted something and you messed it up. Now, God's ways are perfect, the Bible says. And physical discipline is not abuse. People do abuse their children and do it wrong, but that doesn't make what God said wrong. You need to understand that. It's just like people, you know, with the gospel. Well, listen, we are saved by grace through faith, plus nothing, minus nothing. When you understand you're a sinner and you cannot save yourself, and you trust in Jesus Christ that he died on the cross and paid for all of your sins, the moment you trust in him as your savior, he gives you everlasting life. He'll never cast you out. He'll never lose you. Now, people will look at that and say, oh, you mean that I can trust Christ the Savior no matter what I'm doing, going to heaven. And then they think, therefore, I'll just go out and live like a bandit or live like the devil. Now, that's an abuse of the truth of God. But it's still true that once you're saved, you're saved forever. Now, if a Christian tries to do that, God will discipline them, but that discipline will never be hell. But you see, God's truth is God's truth. Now, there are people who will take it too far or abuse it and misuse it, but that doesn't negate the fact that it's there. This issue of child training is an example of that. Okay, now let's go on. It says, the rod and reproof give wisdom. The rod means the rod. And reproof, that's verbal instruction, that's, that's rebuking your children when, when need be. That doesn't mean hollering and screaming at them. Okay? Your children must be in submission to your authority as a parent. Your children must be in submission to your authority as a parent. If your children will not listen to you, how can you teach them? If you can't teach them, they can't be a disciple because a disciple is a learner. They're not going to learn anything from you if they're not listening to you. And they're not going to listen to you unless they respect you. So respect is foundational, and it comes through discipline. It comes through discipline. Your children must respect you. And one of the biggest problems we have today in the public school system is that kids are not learning anything. And the reason they're not learning is because the tools that were there in generations past have been taken out of the hands of the teachers. The parents no longer back up and support the teachers. They're in conflict with the teachers. And the kids figure, I can go to school and I can uh, be a rat in a bum in class and be disrespectful and throw things at the teacher and hit them and curse at them and everything else. And nobody can do anything about it. And there are some kids who think that way. You might say, where's the problem? It's not with the kid, it's with the parents. Okay? It's with the parents. Our parents did a fine job in teaching us respect for authority growing up. I'll tell you what, friends, when I was in school and my name was called for anything, even something good, my blood ran cold. My blood ran cold. Didn't matter what it was. It was terrible. But you know what? Respect for authority. As we grew up, we wouldn't think of getting smart mouth with a teacher or this or that. Why? We'd pay the price when we got home. My dad was a patriot, okay? He laid down the stripes. We saw stars. I mean, he was, a, he was a patriot. Never abused us, though. He never, ever abused us. Your children must be in submission to your authority as a parent. Three vital truths to learn up front here, okay? First is this. As a parent, it is your God-given right to have your children in submission, okay? It is your God-given right. Look with me at this verse, Colossians chapter 3, verse 20. It says this. It says, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Okay? So God expects and tells children to obey their parents in all things. That's having respect for authority. It is your God-given right as a parent to have your children in submission. It is your God-given right. Secondly, it is a God-given command. It is a God-given command, not a suggestion a command. Ephesians 6, 4. This is the key verse, isn't it, in this series? Look at it with me. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, anger, but bring them up in the nurture, that's training, and admonition, that's putting into the mind, of the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up. 
Okay, we are commanded to train them properly and to teach them properly. Number three, and get this one, for the parent to not do this properly is for the parent to be disobedient to God. For the parent to not do this properly is for the parent to be disobedient to God. Do we understand that? If we do not discipline our children for rebellion, we are disobeying God. It's a matter of disobedience on my part. I am just as guilty as a child, just as guilty as a child. Parents, if your children smart off to you, and chances are they will, what are you going to do? I say, well, I'll just ignore it. It'll go away. No, it won't. You know what? That one smart off, you know what they did? They kind of went this way. They kind of tested the waters a little bit and see if I can get a little, gain a little ground in the battle for authority, in the battle for who's boss in our family. And when your kid smarts off to you, don't pretend it didn't happen. Some parents do that one too. Or they'll do it in public. And parents, because they're flustered, they'll look at someone and say, <laughs> aren't they cute? No, that's not cute. It's rebellion. And you need to take care of it. And when your child does that, they're stepping up to you and kind of getting in your face. And if you don't take care of that, dear friend, they're going to come back and they're going to do it again and they're going to try more and more to do the wrong thing with you. You need to stand. You need to stand firm. I can remember the first time. I don't remember which of our children it was. I can remember the first time they said no. Got firm, got right up to their face. What'd you say? You never, don't you ever say no to me again. I mean, their blood ran cold, white with fear. Oh, I don't think that's right. You know what? They didn't do it again. They didn't do it again. Why? They stepped up. They tried to go over the line. As, was that abusive? That wasn't abusive. It's teaching them. It's discipleship. That's a form of discipline. That's the rebuke. That's the reproof. It's teaching them. You're not the boss. I'm the boss. Oh, I don't like that. Wait a minute now. Remember, we've already covered it. We've established it. That's your place as a parent. You are the boss. And if they don't think you're the boss, they'll never believe God's the boss. What is rebellion? Let's define it and recognize it. Rebellion. What is it? You know, I could ask around the room here. We get some things. Let me give you some secular dictionaries. Three of them. Webster's. Webster's. Rebellion. Opposition to one in authority or dominance. In the context of family, opposition to mom and dad. That would be rebellion. When they oppose you, when they stand against you, when they get smart with you, when they don't do what you said, it is what we call rebellion. That is what rebellion is. The American Heritage Dictionary, an act or a show of defiance towards an authority or an established convention. And let me mention this. An established convention would be the rules of which one lives under. That would be an established convention. The rules under which one lives. An act or show of defiance towards an authority and an established convention. So you say to little, you know, Johnny Monster, you say, Johnny, Johnny, I want you to go and I want you to pick up your room. There you go. There you go. They've just shown you rebellion. Are you going to take care of it? You going to let it go? Or are you going to say something like, are your legs okay? No, his leg's fine. He's using it. How about this one? Cambridge Dictionary. To rebel, the verb, to rebel. To fight against the government or to refuse to obey rules, etc. To fight against the government. Now, in the home, the government is the parents. And so when a child fights against the parents, that is rebellion. Now remember that there is active rebellion and there is passive rebellion, but both are rebellion and both are just as bad. What is active rebellion? Let me give you a couple examples. You tell them to do something and they say, no, parents don't ever, ever, ever let your kids say no to you in that context. Never. Don't ignore it. Don't pretend it didn't happen. It's going to come back to haunt you if you don't take care of it. That's act of rebellion. Or you tell them not to do something and they go and do it anyway. That's active rebellion. Listen, I don't want you to go out into the street. Next thing you do, you look and where are they? They're in the street. Oh, I forgot. Well, I'm going to teach you how not to forget. Okay. That's a bunch of baloney. They didn't forget anything. They're liars. Oh, pastor, that's so mean. That's not mean. You're trying to help your child. 
passive rebellion. What is passive rebellion? This is the one that a lot of parents don't want to accept. They ignore you, and they pretend they didn't hear, and you know they did. They ignore you. They do not want you to tell them what to do. Or you ask them to do something, and they do it extremely slowly. Okay? That's passive. That's passive rebellion. Both of them are wrong. Both of them are rebellion. Both of them will lead to a messed up life if you do not straighten that out and get that taken care of. How about this one? When you tell your child to do something, they say to you, just a minute, or they ignore you. What are they doing? They are training you to submit to their will. Do you get it? They're training you as a parent. Now, some of the parents have gotten into this thing, and if you do this, I'm just telling you, don't do it or quit doing it, okay? They do the one, two, three. Yeah, it's no wonder parents are worn out today, pulling their hair out. There's the issue of they simply will not listen and they want their own way. What you have to do is you just need to be consistent in your discipline and don't let them have their way, okay? You don't let them say no to you. You don't let them not do what you told them to do. You have to train them. And training them has to do with, you know, we we talk about a disciplined life. That is a trained life. The idea is that your children do what you say. They respect you. They respect you, all right? You'll hear me talk more about this in the future, but I believe this. It's something called first-time obedience. You need to be training your children to first-time obedience. Now, first-time obedience, it takes more work on the front end, but it pays off big dividends down the road. It's when they get older, yes, there's more reasoning that goes on, and you're talking with them, and there's more verbal instruction and discipleship in that way. But when they're little, they don't, listen, you don't reason with a toddler. You don't reason with a toddler, with a a little child. They just don't get it. They don't understand adult concepts. They have to understand, and you deal with them God's way on that. Key principles to be realized. Here we go. Number one, children need corrective discipline because they are naturally sinful. (gasps) Oh, we hate that word. Children need corrective discipline because they are naturally sinful. With this statement, we fly directly into the face of most humanistic thought. I say most because it's something I'm going to read to you in just a minute. Look at Psalm 51, verse 5. This is what the psalmist said. This is the inspired word of God. It says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, it doesn't mean the act of conception was a sin, but it means what came of it, he's a sinner. He's a sinner. We are sinners by nature. That's why we need a savior. That's why you can't get to heaven the way you are. You might say, well, I'm going to get there. I'm going to live right and all that. No, it doesn't take, it, it doesn't fix the problem. You need a new birth. You have to be born again. You need a new birth from above. You can't go to heaven the way you are. We're not designed for heaven. We're fallen. We're sinful. We're defective. Say, stop it, stop it. It's violating my self-esteem. Well, you need to hear the truth on this. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. I'm a sinner. I stand before you this morning, a sinner. The difference, though, is I know I'm going to heaven because I've been justified by the grace of God. I put my faith in Christ. God gave me his righteousness the moment I believed. He gave me a new nature, and that's what I'm going to heaven with. The old nature can't get into heaven. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Children need corrective discipline because they are naturally sinful. Under that, A, we are conceived sinners. The sin nature in a child is what produces rebellion. It is selfish. It is self-centered, and it wants its own way. It is selfish, it is self-centered, and it wants its own way. Sounds like a lot of adults I know. Temper tantrums are not cute. Foot stomping is not cute. Beating up on other children is not cute. Well, they're boys. It's wrong. Listen, teach your children. You're right. Stop at your nose. You don't have a right to beat up another person. You don't have a right to steal their toys. You don't have a right to hurt people. They are sinful manifestations of the sin nature. Our refusal to do what we say is not cute. When a child doesn't do what you say, it's rebellion. Under this, secondly, we go astray from the womb. We go astray. We're off track. We're out of orbit from the moment we're born. 
Psalm 58, 3, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born speaking lies. Oh, no, not my little perfect one. Listen to this. By the way, the word strange means turned aside. Listen to this. Here's what I was going to read to you. This is July 1st, 2007, a report in the London Telegraph. Are you ready for this? I'm glad you're sitting down. Psychologists. Now, we don't believe what we believe because psychologists say it, but it's interesting when after centuries they finally come around to what God said thousands of years ago. Matter of fact, Proverbs, okay, 1000 B.C., Psychologists have finally learned that children begin to lie in infancy and that by two years old they are sophisticated liars. This is from the London Telegraph now. The article, quote, babies not as innocent as they pretend, unquote. This is a secular book. It said, quote, behavioral experts have found that infants begin to lie from as young as six months. Simple fibs help to train them for more complex deceptions later in life. I've taught this for years. Until now, psychologists had thought the developing brains were not capable of the difficult art of lying until four years old. Following studies of more than 50 children and interviews with parents, Dr. Vasudevi Reddy of the University of Portsmouth Psychology Department says she has identified seven categories of deception used between six months and three years old. There's more than that. Infants quickly learned that using tactics such as fake crying and pretend laughing could win them attention. By eight months, more difficult deceptions became apparent such as concealing forbidden activities or trying to distract parents' attention, unquote. I think that's a great one. That's sophisticated, trying to distract a parent's attention. What do you think about that, concealing forbidden activities? Eight months. Man, now listen, these are secular people, not some Bible-banging fundamental believer like us. So we are conceived sinners. We go astray from the womb. Third under this, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Look with me to Proverbs 22, 15. Look at what it says. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. It is the parent's job before God to get it out of your child and train them to be wise. The opposite of foolishness is wisdom. The opposite of foolishness is wisdom. You notice according to God, what gets it out of the child? Is it bribery? It's what some parents do. Now we're going to Sam's Club. If you behave, I'll give you a big bowl of ice cream. Wrong. Do not do that. Do not do that. Now, if you surprise them sometime for good behavior, that's another thing. But do not bribe them on the front end. What's going to get it out? According to the Bible, the rod of correction. Turning the other way, is that going to get it out? No. Making excuses for your child, is that going to get it out? No. By the way, If you tell them enough false reasons why they do what they do, they'll start telling you the same ones back. Well, little, little, uh, I keep using Johnny Monster. Okay, let's let's think of a new one. Uh, How about Darcy Deception? There's one. (laughs) Little Darcy Deception. The reason you beat up on Johnny Monster, which is not good for Johnny Monster, but Darcy, the reason you beat up on Johnny is because you're tired, right? That's why you beat up on Johnny, right? Uh, uh. Anything to get out of it. So what happens the next time she beats up on him? Darcy, what'd you do? Why'd you do that? Which is a dumb thing to ask him. But what, what'd you do? I, I beat up on him. Why'd you do that? I was tired. Kids are laughing because they've used it. <laughs> God says children need this, folks. Now listen, you're going to believe God or not? Are you going to believe God or not? I'll just give you the second point today, and then we're going to, I'm going to cover something else. We're not going to stop, but I'm going to cover something else very briefly. But the second point where we're going to pick up next week is this. Correct discipline is an indication of how much you love your child. Discipline and love are not in conflict. They go together. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and disciplines every son whom he receives. You know, if my child was going to run out into the road, if I care, I will say, I do not want you to go out there. Do not go out there. And if that child then disobeys and goes out into the road, I'm going to discipline the child. 
Why? Because I love them, I do not want them to be tired. Do you get it? Run down, tired, forget it. You get the idea. In modern vernacular, I do not want my children to be roadkill. Okay? Therefore, I will do whatever is necessary to train them not to disobey in that area. They don't have to know the reason. They need to know you don't do it. That's why a kid who's one and a half years old or two years old, you're not going to complete, you know, well, you know, the laws of physics, the truck is bigger than you, and therefore if the big truck hits the little you, it's going to be a problem. You're not going to be able to, they don't understand that. They understand this. No, you don't do that. You don't do that. And if they do it, they pay a price because you're training them because you love them. Now, listen, God does that for us. God does that for us. And why? Because he loves us. And can I mention this today in closing? Friend, God loves you. God loves you. And God wants you to live forever with him. But there's a problem. The problem is what's called sin. Sin separates us from God. We're all sinners. We've already seen it. We're we're conceived sinners. You're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. Now, you cannot get to heaven with your sin. God says you have to be as righteous as he is to get into heaven. None of us are. We've all fallen short. Therefore, there's really nothing we could do to make ourselves as righteous as God because we're already flawed. We come into the world flawed. God says our sin must be paid for. He's a God of justice. God of love, yes, but a God of justice. And he says if we pay for our sins, we're going to have to die and spend forever in hell to pay for our sins. A lot of people think good works will take care of this. No, good works will not pay for sin. Good works will not get you to heaven. There's nothing we can do to work this sin off. We'll see that in just a minute. Because there's nothing we could do, but God's so loving us and wanting us to live with him forever in heaven, he took care of the problem for us. Now watch this. Let this hand represent God in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was sinless. And he came into this world, and when Jesus died on the cross, he took our sin upon himself, and he made the payment for us by shedding his blood. He was buried and came back from the dead. The Bible says this, that if you will put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, he'll give you everlasting life. See, the transition is this. Look at it. For he, God, hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, Christ knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When you trust Christ as your Savior, the payment Jesus made is good on your behalf. He gives you his righteousness as a gift of his grace. If you look with me to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, It says this, for by grace, undeserved kindness, are you saved. Through what? Not good works, through faith, trusting in Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Not of works. Why is it not of works? We could never do enough to pay for it. God offers it to us as a gift. He paid for it through Jesus Christ And he's offering you today the gift of eternal life. Would you trust in Christ as your Savior today? Would you trust in Christ? He'll give you salvation as a gift. If you won't trust in Christ, then you're saying, I reject the payment he made. I will pay for my own sins. Friends, that's forever separated from God in torment. Wouldn't it be better to take God at his word and receive it today? Receive the gift of his grace. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.